Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Hello and welcome everyone to The Andrew Lawton Show, Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. I'm going to suspend my conversation with you, the audience, right now and address an audience of one. If you're out there, Minister Morneau, blink twice if you need help. Blink three times if you're okay. I don't know, just you clearly have to be somewhere in captivity right now with all the stories we've been seeing about your relationship with Justin Trudeau. This is actually quite exceptional. Last week we talked about Bill Morneau apparently falling out of favor with Justin Trudeau and and reports, uh, namely one in Bloomberg, that Morneau no longer had the confidence of the Prime Minister of Justin Trudeau. And the great story there was when uh, the media had asked uh, Justin Trudeau's office, hey, do you uh, still have confidence in Morneau? And they said, "Uh, we'll have to get back to you on that. And then hours later sent out this statement saying, yes, of course, we have confidence in him. He's done this and this and this and this. Uh, But the interesting thing is that this relationship has only gotten more strained in the last week, in the the last uh, however many days since that moment. And now we have uh, another report from Bloomberg that is uh, suggesting the rift with uh, uh, Finance Minister Bill Morneau is uh, so bad that Morneau can't even get Justin Trudeau on the phone. This is quite embarrassing. Uh, The quote says, Carney's sudden involvement caught Morneau by surprise, one insider said. It was an embarrassing development given the finance minister has struggled at times to get Trudeau on the phone himself. Now, the Carney in question is Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of Canada turned governor of the Bank of England, who's now an, an informal advisor, whatever that means to Justin Trudeau on matters of finance. So seemingly edging out uh, Bill Morneau, who's supposed to be the chief advisor on matters of finance to Justin Trudeau. So now Carney has basically been brought in. He is the uh, Lou Gehrig and Bill Morneau is the Wally Pip. And if you don't get that reference, it's okay. It's the only sports reference I know. So what I'm thinking here is that all of us are going to see Bill Morneau likely go down the same road that Jane Philpott and Jody Wilson-Raybould went down because he is only useful as long as he's towing the party line. He's only useful to Justin Trudeau when he is going to be uh, another one of those cabinet sycophants, because this seems to be the attitude here. If you're in the cabinet, you don't just have to have caucus unity and cabinet unity, which is understandable, but you can't have any disagreement at all, it sounds like, because Justin Trudeau is the guy in charge. Now, it's not leadership when you aren't even having conversations with the people on your team, as this report suggests, if you have these disagreements. And that's where we are now. So I'm thinking Bill Morneau is either now a a great hostage to Justin Trudeau's uh, prime minister's office, or he's just completely out to lunch, uh, floating out on his own, no idea what's going on. He's out of the loop. He has no power, no control whatsoever. It's, I mean, look, both things are possible here. What we do know is that it doesn't look like if these reports can be uh, taken at face value, like Morneau has a, a strong, robust future in the Prime Minister's inner circle. One source told CBC that the two of them were going to be meeting on Monday to sort out their differences. Another story here from uh, the same one, uh, trudeau Morno clash over green plans, soaring deficit. And this one I, I find to be great. It again uses that term of a deepening rift between Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his finance minister about coronavirus spending, but also disagreements, they say, about uh, green initiatives. And this was citing three sources. But here's the part I find unique about this story. Global News had its own version of it. Everyone's leaking all over the place here. And in that story, they say a source says he was not very keen on a huge deficit. That's not what he wanted as his legacy. 
unquote. So Bill Morneau, after five years of continuously running up deficits and more deficits and more deficits, has decided, oh, yeah, you know, I, I don't think uh, the deficit spending thing was exactly what we wanted. Whereas I'm like, what, did, what on earth did you think your legacy was going to be at this point? So I get the je- deficits may have been Justin Trudeau's bag and that's what he wanted, but I don't have a lot of sympathy for Morneau after five years of running up deficits saying, Well, okay, you know, I kind of would have wanted to balance at least one budget while I was here. No, because none of the financial or fiscal decisions taken by the government under Morneau as finance minister have been leading towards anything but deficits. So again, we're talking about anonymous sources here. You have to take things with a grain of salt. But the fact that there's such a high volume of leaks in numerous media outlets from CBC to Global to Bloomberg, all really saying the same thing about the so-called rift and about Morneau uh, really cooling on the Liberal government's uh, financial track record. All of this suggests that there is in fact fire here because we're certainly seeing the smoke. So I don't have a lot of sympathy for Morneau, even though I think he is on the surface a, a capable and competent person, because of how he has done so far. You have to question, okay, why now? I mean, the only thing I could think of, and and this is, I admit, completely speculative, is that he sees the ship as being one that is sinking now and realizes, okay, I've got to save myself. So he's trying to clamber around for the life raft, and it doesn't matter if the ship is going down, he wants to be off of it. And, And I think in a lot of cases, that's what distinguishes this, if he is on his way out from Jody Wilson, Ray Bold, and Jane Philpott, who actually sacrificed something when the, there was still a, a chance and clearly a likely chance that Justin Trudeau would win re-election. They could have, if they just shut up and went along with it, still been in cabinet today. So that is where there's a bit of a difference here, and I have to be a fair bit more cynical about Morneau than I am at uh, the two women from cabinet in the last session of parliament. But I do think that at the end of the day, the buck stops with Trudeau. There's a lot from this that we can take and look at Trudeau's governance and government style and leadership style and say, if you're, if this is what's happening to your most senior cabinet ministers, remember, we're talking about the health minister, the attorney general, the finance minister. This is not like the deputy under, uh, the, this is not like the deputy parliamentary secretary. That's not a real role. The parliamentary secretary to the minister for democratic institutions or something. We're talking about the most central pivotal figures in a prime minister's cabinet. And Justin Trudeau can't keep them in the cabinet. He can't keep them loyal. And there's a reason for that because he clearly is not in their view in control of things. He's clearly not in their view knowing what is going on and making the right decisions. And that's a a very dangerous development here. So right now, when you look at what Morneau is doing, I think he is actually being thrown under the bus right now for speaking up. And we can see this because all of these leaks are coordinated. When you've got, again, a a broad array of leaks through multiple media outlets, it means someone wants this story to be told. And dis- and the fact that Trudeau, again, had to just say, ah, you know, we'll, we'll think about whether we can say we have confidence in him last week, suggests there is no confidence there. And at this point, it's just a matter of controlling the damage. Because if you lose your finance minister in the middle of a public health crisis that is now a financial and economic crisis, it shows that Canadians shouldn't have confident in the, uh, confidence in the job you've been doing either. So if you have your finance minister gone, it's saying to every Canadian, well, that steady hand you told us that you were is no longer steady. That uh, fiscal management that you said was there clearly wasn't. If your finance minister isn't happy with all the stuff you're doing, why should we as taxpaying Canadians be? And these are very legitimate questions, very legitimate questions, and there still are no answers. We'll be back in a moment with more of The Andrew Lawton Show. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. 
Last week, I did a bit of a broad look at the conservative leadership race. I took the 30,000-foot view from the sky of things, and I got a lot of really interesting response from that, a lot of it very negative, because I kind of did it as though I was just criticizing every single candidate by talking about what I see as the perceived weaknesses. And some people who were fans of an individual candidate said uh, they didn't like what I said about theirs, but they liked what I said about all the others. So uh, that is the, the nature of leadership races or any election in, in that you get very hypersensitive about your person. And the fact is, I don't have a person. I, I think that there, like I said, is a lot of good. There are some drawbacks. I think that ultimately the goal is that whoever is the leader of the party after August 23rd has to be able to unite the party, yes, but also has to be able to be a solid conservative. And I want to see someone who's prepared to really move the ball a little bit down the line. I'm, I'm, I don't even like sports. and I'm using sports analogies today. I don't know what happened to me. Maybe I got hit in the head with a football on the weekend and I don't know about it. And it's causing me to like do sports stuff. But I, I promise you I won't do it again. But you need someone who's going to be able to do that. Otherwise, you cease to have a conservative party. And this is what I think the big problem with the so-called electability narrative is. Electability is important, yes. But if you are sacrificing integrity or sacrificing something else like ideological consistency in the pursuit of electability, you being elected doesn't actually mean anything. It doesn't actually amount to a hill of beans. And this is where you have to be very careful. When everyone talks in the race about so-and-so is the one who can beat Trudeau, Yes, that's valid. Yes, the next conservative leader has to defeat Trudeau, but they have to be beating Trudeau to as a means to an end. That cannot be the end in and of itself. And this is, I think, a distinction that gets lost, is that you have to be willing to offer something to conservatives if it has to be of value at all that you are defeating Trudeau and that you can defeat Trudeau. And this is just a general observation. This is bigger than just this particular leadership race and bigger than conservative internal politics in general, is that you have to be prepared to advance the cultural beliefs and the ideological beliefs and the philosophical outlook that you have. And this is where, when you talk about politics being downstream of culture, conservatives have oftentimes fallen short of this requirement. So that's a more of a general observation. But when we are looking at these candidates, there is that idea that, yes, you have to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Trudeau or whoever his successor is, sure. But I want to see someone who's prepared to actually take on the fights that, for the most part, conservatives have been too afraid to. And it isn't just about social issues. It isn't just about supply management. It's not about these things. Although a lot of these issues are litmus tests for the bigger issue. If you're, I mean, supply management's a great one. Not a single member of this leadership race I've heard speak out against supply management. But for the most part, I bet that any one of them, if you were to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, would privately tell you they have issues with it. But politically, they can't. And this is why Maxime Bernier in 2017 and beyond made such a big deal of supply management, not because it was the hill to die on because of dairy pricing being the top issue facing Canadians, but because it was probably the greatest example of conservatives overlooking what they know to be true based on their outlook because of what is politically advantageous to believe. And you can't piss off the dairy farmers. That's the cardinal rule of conservative politics. So they have to choose that axiom of political management over what they believe and what makes sense and what is economically right, which, by the way, supply management isn't. But this will be a topic for another episode. So that's where we are. And you may remember on Friday, I sat down, well, I sat down last Wednesday, but the, the episode came out on Friday, an in-depth interview with Andrew Scheer, uh, an outgoing leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, who said in the interview he's going to continue to serve and, and seek re-election as a member of parliament, so he's not going away. And, you know, I had a lot of people email me uh, so a lot of you, by the way, most of you were incredibly appreciative of the interview and had very kind words to say, and I'm I'm grateful for that. If you haven't been able to figure it out now, I, I really enjoy long-form interviews. But there were a lot of people who, because of their 
personal contempt for Andrew Shear, or dislike for Andrew Shear, didn't like that I was giving him a platform or they didn't like that they just didn't want to hear from him. And you know, it takes a lot to step into politics. And and I'd say this as someone who was a, a failed candidate or as I say, an attempted politician a few years ago, a couple of years ago. It takes a lot. And Andrew Shear has a young family. There's a tremendous sacrifice. You get dragged through the ringer. His family gets roped into it. And it's not just Andrew Scheer. I would say this about a liberal leader, an NDP leader, even, well, maybe not a Bloc Quebecois leader, but I'd say it about most politicians. Anyone who's prepared to take on that sacrifice deserves to be commended and they deserve to be appreciated. And I, and I don't like this idea that because Andrew Scheer was not able to, I won't use a sports analogy, was not able to win the election, that he is therefore a bad person. I mean, you can be, a, I don't think he's necessarily a bad politician, but you can be a bad politician and not be a bad person. In fact, I think probably the uh, the, the best people uh, don't necessarily make the best politicians and, and vice versa. So for Andrew Scheer, there was a lot that I think could have been done differently, and it was really great to hear him admit that in many respects, because one of the biggest criticisms that I've had is that Andrew Scheer was great in the 2017 leadership race, he was great in the lead-up to the election, and then in the election he just became this safe, middle-of-the-ground, middle-of-the-road, moderate, uh, not even just in terms of the platform, although the platform was very safe, but even just his own communication style. He wasn't picking fights. He wasn't scrapping. And and I was really disappointed to see it because I knew that he is on side on a lot of the things that I care about. And then after the election, we're getting clip after clip after clip of Andrew Scheer. I, this one in particular, I have to share again. Do you remember when he was busted, if I can use such a silly term, for not wearing a mask <laughs> in Pearson Airport when he was talking to a couple of his colleagues. And this was what happened when CBC asked about it. Hi, it's Annie Bergeron Oliver with CTV National News. Um, masks became mandatory yesterday in many cities across Canada, yet yesterday you were photographed at the airport not wearing a mask. Elizabeth May earlier today said she does not believe that you take this pandemic seriously. So one, I'm wondering why you didn't wear a mask. And two, what do you say to people like Elizabeth May who say you're not taking the pandemic seriously? So uh, I don't have anything to add based on the story yesterday. Nothing? <laughs> I think it was pretty self-explanatory yesterday. I know that in part of the statement, you said you took off the mask to make a call. Um, Pallister has since come out saying he apologized that, yes, he took it off for a call, but he wanted to chat uh, with some of his colleagues. Should you not be setting an example for Canadians? There are many people who do not believe that masks should be mandatory. Should you not be setting an example for Canadians and, and nothing else to add? As I said yesterday, I was wearing a mask while I was traveling, so I don't have anything else to add to that story. It's hard to believe that this is actually your question and your follow-up when we're dealing with a prime minister that is under an investigation for ethics violation for the third time. We're dealing with $300 billion worth of deficit with no recovery plan, with no budget this year. And you want to know how long I had my mask off yesterday after making a phone call? Come on, that's ridiculous. You did have a mask I think the, <laughs> I think the picture is pretty self-explanatory. I think my... My answer yesterday was pretty self-explanatory as well. And if you want to go like analyze social media uh, pictures, if you're looking for some kind of Zapruder film to break down frame by frame, I think that's pretty ridiculous and kind of a wasted opportunity today when we're talking about an economic snapshot today that's going to tell Canadians how the next few months and years are going to roll out when we have the highest unemployment rate in the G7. We're the only G7 country to have experienced a credit downgrade. And, and I remember saying, where on earth was that Andrew Scheer during the election? Where on earth was that Andrew Scheer when uh, we were trying to get, you know, <laughs> Justin Trudeau out of office? I don't mean we as, as you know, me at True North. I mean, we as, you know, most taxpaying Canadians. And that was that. And, and I was so like, it, it kind of proved the point which is that, yes, he has it in him. So I asked him about that aspect of his personality and whether he felt that he was able to truly be himself on the campaign trail. And I thought he actually had a really good answer about it. Here's that clip. Did you feel like you were able to be the Andrew Scheer you wanted to be during the election? Because it seems to me and, and to a lot of people that I've heard from that there was a market shift in pre-election Andrew Scheer to election Scheer, and then also post-election Scheer. 
And, and it seems like you were a lot more restrained. And I don't mean that in a, in a way that you're bombastic or, or radical or anything outside of the election, but you were a lot more restrained and, and a lot of people didn't feel like your personality, Sean. Is that something that you would view as a fair assessment? I think there's definitely something to that. Uh, it's it's a sh it, normal human beings don't communicate the way politicians do. It's true. You know? Like <laughs> you know, normally you want to say something, you pick up the phone, you mm -hmm. telephone your friend. We have to communicate through different filters. You know, we have to speak to journalists, we have to do interviews, we have to put content on social media, and so there, I think over time. You know, you are trying to refine a message. You are trying to simplify a message, stay focused on a message. And sometimes over time, you can it suddenly becomes, well, this isn't really how you would put it, or this isn't how what you what your actual take on mm -hmm. something is. And I, I do think, you know, if, in retrospect, if I look back, uh, uh, I did, <laughs> you know, I think of some of the things that I've I've said or done after I announced I was stepping down when the pressure's off a little bit. You're Nothing not, to lose. Yeah, you know, yes. be, let Andrew be Andrew, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, sometimes I kind of feel, yeah, geez, I wonder if we could have done more of that. You know, there's, you know, you do want to, you know, polish a message and, 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 and make sure that there's a clear contrast between your party and the other guys. So there's a need for that. But it, sometimes I did think that, uh, in lo looking back, that maybe I wasn't always able to connect in a, in a, in a, in an authentic way that, and let my, my own personality come through. Cause I think that's what Canadians, I think all voters are looking for that. And that's one of the things, you know, I've challenged myself and did I always, was I always able to do that? And, you know, I, I think there's something to be said for sometimes just throwing away the notes and, and, uh, and just, you know, saying, saying what comes in your head. Yeah, I appreciated his candor on that because I, I was worried that it would just be sort of this general reflection retrospective of, you know, not really saying or committing to anything. But but he was very frank in that, and, and I was very grateful for it. And there was a, another point in the interview as well. I, I would encourage you to go back and, and watch the whole thing. It's about 30 minutes long. And there was another point that I, I really appreciated where he was talking about what I mentioned earlier on in the show, the importance of really moving conservatism and advancing conservatism. And that's a, a huge, huge issue of concern. And, and I hope that he's not done with that now that he is going to continue in public service, albeit not as conservative leader. So uh, we didn't, uh, because we were doing the interview, we didn't get a chance to break it down or analyze it in the uh, post-interview show. So uh, that's what we're doing now. And I just want to say thank you to all of you who uh, wrote out and had some really kind things to say about that interview. I, I like doing it. And I, I got to do it in the fireside chat a couple of weeks ago with Derek Sloan and Aaron O'Toole. And I, someone else, had said you should do more interviews. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do them. I just want to make sure that there are people worth talking to. So if you have ideas of, of people I should sit down with, let me know. And we'll, as we uh, plan the show in the uh, weeks and months ahead, we'll, we'll try to incorporate some of those. Now that like we're allowed to sit in the same rooms as people, because I, I don't like Skype interviews as much. They have a role, but I digress. So all of this, I, I think, sets the stage for where we are right now in the conservative leadership race. As I mentioned, August 23rd, so less than a week until the ballots are counted and the winner is announced. And then from there, the, the next leader has to hit the ground running potentially heading in to an election if uh, Yves-Francois uh, Blanchet and the Bloc continue to uh, put the pressure on the government and, and say they want to uh, defeat the government and, you know, if the NDP finally wake up from their slumber and decide they want to as well. So I find it interesting, though, in the home stretch, you have leadership candidates going all over the country doing these ballot drop-off sites where they'll go to a house in a community and they'll just tell people, listen, for an hour, come and drop your ballots off. And if you see on Twitter, the campaigns all have like pictures of like boxes and boxes and boxes of envelopes, which normally would look a bit sketchy, but in a leadership race is par for the course. And what they're doing is trying to get every last member vote in before the deadline for ballots to be received, which is on Friday the 21st. So when you're going after conservative members, conservative Party of Canada members, those are the only people that can vote in the race, there are certain places that I don't think you're likely to find them, like, for example, the Toronto Star. Remember how last week I was talking about Peter McKay uh, seeming to fear or just simply dislike independent media? Well, after months of McKay turning down requests for independent media and many other interview requests, by the way, from what I've heard, he does a, a full interview with the Toronto Star in which he not only... <laughs> 
<laughs> this is great. He basically threatens to fire a lot of the people on his team in this interview. Let me read the exact quote on this because it's just too great. Uh, the article says, McKay is still widely seen as the front runner, but he recognizes that he needs to change and the people around him need to change should he assume the party leadership. Quote, your campaign team for leadership is not necessarily your campaign team for a general election, McKay said, but I'm not presuming anything. Much more of the planning will have to happen after August 21st when the leadership results are announced, unquote. Now, what he's saying, by the way, is not necessarily untrue. Yes, your team is going to change. You're going to expand it, potentially bring people in from other teams. But when you want people to drive hard in the final few days, uh, basically saying, oh, yeah, some of them aren't going to make the cut and we're... Some of our teams got to change. Probably not the best way to motivate the people on your team to, uh, you know, give it everything they've got in, in the home stretch if they think that there's not going to be a job on the other end of it for them or something like that. And the reason this is so important is because uh, Peter McKay has always been throughout this race, it seems, in conflict with his team, where he'll say something, then they'll say something else, or they'll send out a tweet and then he'll apologize for it, or he'll sit down for an interview and then they'll end it and then he'll apologize for ending it. And I mean, there's been this conflict there. And one of the big problems from everything I've heard is that there are way too many cooks in that kitchen, where just so many people, it becomes impossible to have a clear, concise message when you've got so many different voices and advisors and, and people. So it ends up being where you have what is a, a pretty disproportionately large team of paid staff for a leadership race. And, and at the end of it, you just have like too many people that are contributing to what's supposed to be a, a unified and, and singular message strategy and approach. But when McKay is basically saying, oh yeah, some of my team's got to go, it would make anyone on that team, I think, a little bit wary of whether they have a future. And if the question was, hey, are you happy with the team you have now or something like that? Now, by the way, I don't know what uh, the question was, but if that was what the reporter asked, it's kind of a trap because you don't want to say yes, because then that says you think your campaign's been perfect when it clearly hasn't. You don't want to say no, which McKay did, because then you're throwing your team under the bus, which is not what leadership is about at all. What you say is, listen, that's a discussion for after the leadership. What we're focused on right now is getting to that home stretch. We've got a great team of people that are working around the clock, yada, yada, yada. That's the answer. And the fact that I'm not one of these official, you know, high paid conservative consultant types, and I know the right answer to that question is, I think, indicative of why this has been such a rocky, rocky campaign and so needlessly so. So all of the McKay uh, defenders on Twitter were saying, uh, you know, <laughs> they're defending this, saying uh, one of them uh, pointed out, oh, that's not what he said at all when I, I shared the quote, and that was exactly what he said. Someone else uh, was saying that, no, 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 what he's doing is he's trying to motivate them to work harder so that they, so he's basically like using the carrot in a stick is what one of the defenses was, which again, I would argue is not at all leadership. And you know, th this is kind of a, an inside fight, I realize, but the bigger issue is that a conservative doing an interview with the Toronto Star after shirking independent media requests and most conservative-friendly outlets for the better part of the campaign, then throwing their team under the bus to the Toronto Star, is not moving small-c conservatism and advancing it. It's not that at all. It's doing the opposite. And... Aaron O'Toole also did the Toronto Star interview. Leslin Lewis did as well. I, I don't think Derek Sloan did. I have less of an issue with that because they have made themselves available to True North, to other conservative-leaning media outlets. So it's not like they're doing one or the other, like McKay did, who's saying, you know, no to Post Millennial, no to True North, no to Rebel, no to, I think, the Toronto Sun, even if memory serves. And saying yes, yes to the Toronto Star. And, you know, I'll give you a little bit of a goodie. I'm going to throw my team under the bus in this interview. And and I, I made a swipe at this on Twitter the other day, and I, I pointed out this fact. And what was interesting is the author of the article, the author of the series, Alex Boutillier from the Toronto Star, had uh, kind of responded and uh, said he agreed with me that this series was not going to move leadership votes. It's not going to get anyone any votes in the leadership race. So even the author of the series is admitting that this isn't going to get anyone any votes, to which I say, okay, why are you doing it 
when the ballots are, are not even counted yet. And there are still conservative members out there who you should be reaching if you're serious about actually getting conservative support. And this is a dynamic in the leadership race that is very important. If they're not prepared to uh, give anything to the base in a leadership race, when the base is the only group that matters, they're certainly not going to give you anything in a general election. And if you take nothing else from this episode, make it that, that typically the song and dance is that in a leadership race, leadership candidates will be the most conservative versions of themselves. You're never going to get more conservative than how you are in a leadership race. If you're really lucky, someone might be as conservative in a general as they are in a leadership. But for the most part, they all become more moderate in the general. It happened with Andrew Scheer. It happened with Stephen Harper. It's happened with leadership races across the country and provinces like Ontario. It happened with Doug Ford. This is what you do because you need to get your base on board, your members on board, and then you have to pivot to a more palatable vision for the electorate. And I can say that I'm frustrated with this, and I can say that I don't think the moderation is necessary and all of that, but the fact remains that you're never going to find more conservatism than you will in someone's leadership platform from them. So if McKay is uninterested in talking right now to conservatives and uninterested in actually putting forward a red meat conservative platform, then he sure as heck isn't going to do anything for conservatives when he's going after the votes of all Canadians. Now, you may look at this and say that he's a what you see is what you get kind of candidate, which is fine. If that's what you want, that is absolutely fine. But the problem with that is that if you want someone to put forward a solid, cohesive, and coherent conservative vision, if you're not getting that in a leadership, you never will. You absolutely never will. And this is where the idea of defeating Trudeau as the goal negates that the whole point of defeating Trudeau, the whole reason why people want Trudeau gone is because they don't like what he's doing. They don't like the liberal, big government, capital P, progressive vision that he's putting forward. Someone has to be prepared to replace that with something. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. And I'm not getting into this whole Trudeau light, liberal light sort of thing. It's not about name calling. It's just about how politics works. If you are trying to get rid of someone, you have to be able to put something forward that is better than what they were doing. And if you're not prepared to do that, you're not offering any contrast or any difference at all. So my caution to conservatives, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I trust people to be able to do that themselves. It is not my place as a broadcaster. It's certainly not True North's place to tell you how to vote. My advice is this. Look at what someone is offering. Look beyond the name, look beyond the logo, look beyond all of that. Look at what someone is offering and understand that you're never going to get 100% of what they're offering now. So think of if someone is offering you X, Y, and Z now, can you live with just X and Y? Can you live with just X? Because that might be all you get. And if they're offering you X, Y, Z, and even that isn't enough for you, vote for someone else. We've got to take a break. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. One of the things I hope you know about me by now is that I, I really value and cherish consistency. And this is something that's very difficult to find from a lot of politicians and, and certainly a lot of commentators. So I have to point out the, the absurdity of right now, everyone going after Donald Trump for, uh, you know, musing about whether the election needs to be postponed and, uh, you know, all of the politicking about mail-in ballots and, and stuff like that. And I, I'm not going to get into that uh, in full this show because I, I think I'm going to look at that in a bit more depth later on. But then you have right now uh, Jacinda Ardern from New Zealand who's being heralded as like this great brave woman 
for delaying the New Zealand election by four weeks. So uh, Prime Minister Ardern has uh, pushed the election back to October 17th for now. Now, obviously, as a Commonwealth country, as a Westminster parliamentary system, there's a bit more flexibility than there is in the rigid American electoral system. But New Zealand, which for the most part has a minimal, minimal caseload right now and had actually eradicated the virus and is only now just looking at at tiny, tiny numbers, is saying, you know what, we had a cluster, so we're going to just to be safe, postpone the election. Whereas, and, and I don't think that, this is necessarily the wrong call, and it doesn't sound like there's a huge amount of pushback. But when uh, Prime Minister Ardern does this, and it's heralded as being, you know, putting your people first, would be dictatorial in the United States. It shows that there is perhaps a, a bit of inconsistency among most political onlookers, which is always important to expose. In stories that I never would have predicted for 2020, if you had asked me in, you know, the year 2000, Ed the Sock, which, as the name suggests, is a a sock, uh, a crusty, in a most literal and figurative sense as possible, uh, commentator, has become, uh, you know, at at one point a a much music personality beloved in Canada, and now this pathetic, uh, groveling liberal shill. Uh, But now Ed the Sock, who has been uh, pretty much a jerk to anyone and everyone who dares criticize the dear leader Justin Trudeau, is now facing his own cancellation as liberals are denouncing Ed the Sock for calling Jagmeet Singh Jughead. Now, this is probably not meant to be racist. I think it was meant to make fun of his name, which at the very least is immature and bad comedy, and at the very worst is uh, tone deaf and insensitive. Uh, but now Press Progress, the the, uh, the full-on NDP front organization, has uh, done the, the denunciation of Ed the Sock, talking about how several liberal MPs, which are supposed to be Ed the Sock's bread and butter, given that I, I don't think uh, the Sock is actually working uh, beyond being just a, an armchair liberal strategy, strategist are distancing themselves from him if you look on Twitter. So this is what's happening right now. And, and again, I, I, I don't like anyone going through the cancel mill. I don't know if, if socks can be canceled or if they just get like, you know, thrown in the wash and he can go through the sock vortex that uh, most people's socks go through uh, when they get washed. Uh, my whole thing is that I didn't know Ed the Sock was still around until he just started, like, tweeting nasty things on Twitter. Uh, Sometimes to me, uh, especially during the election. He wasn't a fan of of us trying to uh, get allowed to cover liberal campaign events because I guess he thought we were uh, taking up a spot on the bus that uh, uh, his royal sockness could be taking up. And in any case, this one I'm going to end on here because I I find this to be just completely devastating. A study called Human Trafficking Public Awareness Research that was done by Enveronics Research Group for the government has polled a number of youth across the country on what they fear. And what they found in this study was that climate change is feared by youth more than drugs, guns, gangs, or traffic accidents. This is, again, the Department of Public Safety's findings. And they asked uh, people how they thought these issues, and they listed them, fared in terms of seriousness. 57% said climate change is an extremely serious threat, ranking greenhouse gas emissions at a higher level of peril than guns, gangs, hate crimes, cyberbullying, and illegal drugs. A quarter of them said it's the most serious issue facing children, and only 13% said so about other issues. And this is a a story that comes courtesy of Black Locks Reporter, which does uh, some tremendously great work on finding all of these different reports and, and studies. This is the product of when you completely and abjectly fear monger to kids about global warming. When something that poses no existential threat to them, that poses no threat to them at all, is feared more than issues that we know are actually causing lives to be lost. The opioid crisis is one of the greatest public health crises the country has ever faced, killing people at a rate that is completely preventable and avoidable. And all of a sudden, kids are more concerned because, you know, AOC is warning about cow farts than they are about something that exists in their schools. You look at human trafficking, a growing issue, something we absolutely need to deal with. And they're more concerned about what David Suzuki is saying than what the traffickers in the next classroom over are talking about and doing. 
So I, this is not to say that it's a zero-sum game. Yes, if multiple things are causing a risk, it's great to be aware of them. I don't like the idea of kids living in fear anyway, when by and large, it's safer to be a kid in 2020 than it was in 1960, 1970, 1980. It's safer now, and we should be happy about that. But my goodness, the fact that we have people fear-mongering to children, telling them that they're going to die, that the world is going to end. When I was at in the election campaign, the climate march in Montreal, all not marching in it i was covering justin trudeau who was there uh, this is when greta thunberg was there and i was actually astonished at how many kids were brought out there whose only frame of reference for these issues is what their parents tell them and kids some of them didn't want to be there there was one in particular i remember that was crying saying i want to leave and the parents were saying no we have to stay and kids that again were were carrying around signs about how their world is dying their world is ending and they're going to die and i'm seeing this thinking like this is absolutely child abuse for parents to be imposing this much made up fear on their children and now the government's own study is proving that this fear mongering is working We've got to wrap things up. My thanks to all of you for tuning into the show today. We'll be back in a couple of days with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show. Thank you. God bless. Good day, Canada. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.